So Bell Labs, um, which did a lot of inventing of a lot of things, uh, all owned within the AT&T Corporation, invented touch tone dialing. Uh, well, it started pretty early on, but they were making the phones and selling them, and touch tone phones were kind of getting out there and replaced the old dial phones, starting in the 60s and then on from there. And um, dial phones are um, frequencies um, and um, different hertz, okay? And those of you who've seen the radio um, spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, know about the hertzes and the wavelengths. And here are the different wavelengths for um, the um, numbers and some of the letters. Um, Actually, those are almost all the letters. Um, so you could play these if you want. I'm not going to now because you won't be able to hear them anyway. But they're different tones and different levels for each sound. And, and this was obviously much faster. Ding, 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 ding. A little imitation there for you. Then rotary, da, 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 you know, nine, etc. You know, much faster dialing. Okay, which allowed for... Um, more efficient telemarketing and, of course, now allows for robo-dialing. Um, okay. Now, this is um, the um, overview of the history of telemarketing um, that I found on the Internet. And I'm um, just going to kind of read through this now. And then we're going to explore um, the four main kinds of telemarketing, um, outbound and inbound, B2B and B2C for each. So as you can see here, even in the early 1900s with rotary phones in B2B, um, some of these big industries uh, where deals were worth a lot of money used telephones to to develop new business and to work on customer relations. And uh, by the 70s, when you have the touchtone phones, this is when um, you could have call centers, both receiving and doing calling. And telemarketing business really began in the 80s, as you can see here. In 81, telemarketing dollars were more than direct mail dollars. And then in 87, it's more than double, so $41.2 billion spent on telemarketing versus $17.2 billion on direct mail. That's according to the American Telemarketing Association. And um, what are the trends that contribute? Well, first, the, the high cost of personal sales calls, right, that we talked about. The time involved, the salaries involved. Uh very, very most expensive kind of uh, prospecting that there is. So telemarketing was more attractive, especially with B2B, as it says. And then you combine that with, you know, uh, eventually VOIP, voice over internet protocol, which we'll talk about a little bit more, computers and databases, um, you know, where you can dial from the database you can either rent the prospecting database and, and dial from that, or you can dial from your own customer database. You can have information about people. You can bring up certain types of customers and have a script designed for a special type of customer, special segment. So all these things, database marketing, computers, Internet, better phone systems combined to make telemarketing more efficient. 800 numbers also helped. Uh, for uh, inbound, particularly ordering, right? Okay, 8550 telemarketing service agencies. And a number of people, companies would use these uh, separate agencies while others set up their own in-house operations. Half million people employed by 85. By 95, there are 900 of these telemarketing agencies and 4.5 million working in all these Agencies, And if you think about it now, there are a lot of people uh, working in telemarketing. I mean, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but 
And lots of these people don't work in call centers. I mean, many of them will just work from home. They'll be set up, you know, by their company uh, to work from home and the company doesn't have to pay for office space. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that's how it's run. Uh, so uh, in-house and outsourced telemarketing operations, um, 565,000 of them by 1995. Okay, and uh, 90 billion a year by night by the mid 90s, generating lots and lots of business for lots and lots of people. So most people have 800 numbers for inbound, and that's the CRM. And this also allowed, by the way, upselling and cross-selling. And here I want you to think for just a tiny little minute about Wells Fargo. Those of you. I uh, usually bring that one up. The scandal is a couple of years old now, but it keeps, <laughs> it's the scandal that keeps on going. There's always something new with Wells Fargo where they've screwed up something. But you may recall, um, whether we discussed it in one of my classes or not, that Wells Fargo, the bank, um, decided that they wanted to cross-sell their customers. Um, so someone with a who was a mortgage customer would be sold an auto loan or a student loan or a, mor a mortgage or whatever the case may be. And, um, and the people who were doing the cross-selling were the tellers in the banks and the people in the customer service uh, call centers getting the 800 numbers, you know, cu customer calling up for some kind of problem. The person might try to get them interested in another product. And um, there were problems here. I mean, it wasn't a bad idea at all, but Wells Fargo had some unrealistic goals about how many accounts people could sell, which made them put a lot of pressure on their customers. So you have these people who are normally, you know, minimum minimum wage employees, frankly, treated very badly and kind of bullied to sell all these accounts. And they ended up uh, falsifying accounts and committing fraud and all kinds of bad things. So um, my usual sort of takeaway from this for my students is, um, well, don't have unrealistic goals, number one. And number two, you know, uh, these people are important, important part of the company. They should be treated well and rewarded and made to feel good about their jobs and positions because if the company does that, they're just going to broadcast that feeling of warmth about the company um, to the customers and that'll just work for everybody. Okay, now there's other 800 numbers, 888, 877, etc. cetera. The 900 number services, there's some fees for this. The 800 numbers basically were um, collect calls that uh, where the company absorbed the fee automatically. I mean, that's the way they worked. Um, okay, 900 number, a little bit different. Outbound telemarketing, very strong for B2B and B2C. So here's all that information, all kinds of people employed. All kinds of goods sold. Oh my goodness, one million calls an hour. These are all US-based companies, by the way. This is before uh, robo-dialing and some of the new things going on when a lot of activities ha is happening outside the US, as a matter of fact. Predictive dialing. Um, so this is uh, computer telephone integration. This is the idea of representative getting getting information about the customers with whom they're speaking. By the way, it's usually, you know, uh, when a, a customer service rep will ask you for your phone number and look you up, or they're, they're pulling up your file so they have that on the computer screen while they're talking to you, and they're pulling that from the customer database. It makes, makes them better able to know who you are and help you with your problems. Okay. And here, just making the point that telemarketing is works with database marketing. Okay. And um, the internet's boost, boosted inbound telemarketing. A lot of people use the web to look at the products and then make call to order. And we know that. And yes, the disreputable image. And that really is the clown in the picture. <laughs> the evil clown in the picture, the bad image, particularly of the business to consumer outbound calling. 
and then fraud had even had started. Of course, you know, where there's where there's opportunities to commit fraud, there's going to be fraud. So there was fraud going on, you know, track tracked being tracked even in the '90s, and of course, uh, it's gotten so much worse um, today. And good, interesting point here is that con artists tend to target older Americans. AARP, 56% of telemarketing fraud is people 50 years or older. 36% of the population, 56% of the fraud. And this, again, is still true today. In fact, I'm going to show you a cover of an AARP magazine, which I just got, uh, listing all the kinds of fraud that are still being perpetrated on people via telemarketing. So this is actually really new data. Um, 800 mil this is going on now with the virus and the problem we're having. 800 million wireless calls a day during the week from Verizon. During the week, more than double the number made on Mother's Day, which is the busiest day of the year. The length of the calls is up 33% from before the outbreak. So reach out and touch someone used to be the slogan for AT&T long distance. Um, this is what people are doing now much more even than they're going on the internet. Internet traffic only up 20 to 25% based on AT&T and Verizon. Now, uh, that was our kind of overview of the history. You know, it started in B2B in the, in the, 1890s, right? But it didn't really get cranked up to consumers until there were touchtone phones and call centers and uh, things like that. And there has been fraud and there have been problems and uh, with uh, that uh, we need to be aware of. But overall, there are lots more phone calls today and lots more, lots more telemarketing calls. Now, I want to go back to a point I've made a couple of times because. Uh, what we're going to go into now is um, uh, this area. We're going to talk about inbound, four different things, B2B inbound calls. Inbound business to consumer, where people are calling an 800 number for customer service or to order. Outbound B2B. And then the controversial one, which is outbound B2C. <laughs> I just watched as much as I could of that movie the other night. <clears throat> it's a long movie. So uh, I'm going to stop it here, and then we're going to start with um, inbound B2B.